Hello all, welcome to another one of our YouTube videos in our design lecture series on design of reinforced concrete structures. We are back with videos regarding this design lecture series after a certain hiatus in this between in these days when we were not continuing with this video lecture series if you have subscribed to our channel on YouTube you will find that we discussed an important concept that you learn in strength of materials course and we discussed about the column theory but today we are continuing with our series on the design of reinforced concrete structures we completed the design of rectangular beams subjected to flexor or bending moments we looked at some theoretical lessons and we were also did some tutorial classes and today we will continue our lecture series and we will begin with the design for shear and torsion so in this lecture we will discuss three main things first we will discuss about the shear stress in beams we will discuss the behavior of concrete under shear and finally we will look at the behavior and design strength in torsion so today will be an introductory class regarding the design for shear in rectangular beams and from next lesson onwards we will go through the behavior of beams with and without shear reinforcement and then we will also look at the design steps for shear forces so a beam although it is primarily a flexural member that is it is primarily subjected to bending moment may also be subjected to such forces as shear forces and axial forces or even our beams may be subjected to torsion and these forces are all in addition to the predominant flexural force so one thing that we have to remember is that the shear stresses in most beams are below the direct shear strength of concrete that means whatever the shear stresses are developed in most of our beams are generally less than the value of the shear strength of our concrete so we are not concerned with the direct shear stress rather we are more concerned with this diagonal tension stress this is also a type of shear stress but it actually is a combination of flexural and shear stress so shear failures is also often termed as diagonal tension failure since our concrete are rather stiff or rather strong towards the direct shear forces uh, the main thing that we have to be concerned about is the combination of flexural and shear stress which is also often termed as the diagonal tension stress so why is shear design important because inherently the shear failures are rather brittle in nature that means they do not exhibit any kind of uh, signals or they do not give any significant signs of distress or warnings before the shear failures occur so they are inherently brittle in nature so inadequate shear design is inherently more dangerous than inadequate flexural design since shear failures normally exhibit fewer significant signs of distress and warnings than flexural failures so design codes are usually more conservative with regard to shear compared to bending and that conservativeness or that conservancy can be seen in the safety factors that we provide for bending moments and shear forces our safety factors or our strength reduction factors are always our strength reduction factor in case of shear are always greater than that compared to bending so if shear reinforcement is not provided shear failure may occur shear failure is characterized by small deflections and lack of ductility so that there is little or no warning before failure as we discussed in this third bullet point here so while our flexural failure is characterized by a gradual increase in deflection and cracking and hence it also gives a warning before total failure our shear failure does not give such kind of warnings so the design for shear must ensure that shear failure does not occur before flexural failure so we always want that the shear strength of our beams are 
equal to at least equal to or greater than the flexural strength so that we always ensure that the flexural failure occurs before the shear failure and this is at all points in our beam so the general formula for shear stress in a homogeneous beam you have learned in your strength of materials course also the general shear formula is given by this v into q divided by i into b where v is the total shear at any section considered that means if we suppose that we have a simply supported beam here which is subjected to some kind of uniformly distributed load then this v represents the shear force at any section where you want to calculate the shear stress that may be either 1 1 section or 2 2 section or 3 3 section this q is the statical moment about neutral axis of that portion of cross section which is lying between the line through point in question parallel to neutral axis and nearest face upper or lower of beam so rather than this long explanation of our symbol here let us look through a diagram if this is our rectangular beam then the neutral axis passes somewhere here the width of your beam is represented as small b and the depth is given a capital D. So if we are concerned with determining the shear stress at this level here, suppose say that this level here, then this Q is the first moment of inertia or the statical moment about this neutral axis of this area here. So if we suppose that the centroid of this area lies somewhere along this line and this centroid is at a distance of y bar from the neutral axis, then this Q is given as the product of area of this hashed section, which I will represent as A and multiplied with this y bar. So Q represents the first moment of inertia or the statical moment of this shaded portion about the neutral axis of our beam. I is the moment of inertia of our cross section about neutral axis and B is the width of the beam at given point. So this B is the width of the beam at that point where you want to determine the shear stress. So if it is a rectangular beam then the value of B will be equal at all places but if the cross section of your beam is varying along the length then you have to use the width at that section where you are calculating this shear stress. So the distribution of bending stress and shear stresses along the depth of a uniform rectangular beam is shown in the diagram here. Whereas your bending stress is zero at the level of neutral axis, the shear stress is maximum at this level. So you can see here rectangular, sorry, triangular distribution of bending stresses and parabolic distribution of shear stresses. The shear stress is maximum at the neutral axis, whereas the bending stresses are equal to zero. And if you want to find the maximum value of shear stress, which is at this very center, that is equal to 1.5 times the average shear. And the value of average shear is given as b by bd so that the value of maximum shear stress at your beam is 1.5 times v over bd so this is about the variation of shear stress along the depth of your beam so if you want to study the behavior of rc beams under shear you may study them under three categories today we will only look at this first which is the behavior when the beam is not cracked and in our upcoming lectures we will discuss this remaining two parts that is the behavior of your beam when it is cracked and when no shear reinforcements are provided and the final is the cracked beam behavior when shear reinforcements are provided so let us only look at this first category today that is the behavior when the beam is not cracked so again i am repeating the same thing in this slide here 
If you look at the diagram on the right hand side of your screen, you can see the shear force and bending moment diagram for different types of beams with different end conditions. For example, you have a simply supported beam here, you have a cantilever beam, you have a simply supported beam subjected to uniformly distributed load. In this first diagram, you have a concentrated load which is acting at the middle of the beam and in this figure number D here, you can see a continuous beam which is subjected to this uniformly distributed load and the corresponding shear force diagram and bending moment diagram are illustrated here. To calculate the value of shear stress, you can draw the shear force diagram and use the value of shear force at that point where you are required to calculate the shear stress. For example, if you want to calculate the shear stress at this point in this re rectangular continuous beam, then you may use the value of this shear force, value of V from this shear force diagram. The same formula I am repeating here, one is for the flexural stress and another is for the tensile stress. And these formulas, both for flexural and tensile stress, these are given for any section of your beam which is lying at a distance of y from the neutral axis. And the value of QB, which I already discussed, is also given here. So let us look at this beam, this diagram of stress distribution in RC beams and discuss about the behavior of uncracked concrete under the shear force. So we can see here, we have a beam that is subjected to some value of uniformly distributed load and which has a certain support condition. We have taken two elements here, one and two. This first element, one element lies along the neutral axis of the beam and the second element lies away from the neutral axis. You may even, first let us ignore these two elements and let us see one element here and another element here. What you will find is that in these two elements which are at two ends of the beam away from the neutral axis, there exists both shear forces in this way and also the tensile and compressive forces also because we know we have seen the distribution of bending stresses which is zero at the neutral axis and has some value and increasing value as we go away from the neutral axis. So if we suppose that the behavior of this beam is such that it bends in this way, then the top surface will be subjected to compressive forces and the bottom fibers or bottom surface will be subjected to tensile force. So in this element at the top, Besides these shear forces, we will also have compressive forces in this way. Whereas in this bottom element here, besides these shear forces, we will have tensile forces in this way. The same is represented for this second element here. If you look at the expanded view of this second element, which is given here, you can see that this second element is also subjected to some shear stresses is represented by tau here and also subjected to these tensile forces that is F. But for element 1 which is lying along the neutral axis is there are no bending stresses. The only stresses that this element 1 is subjected is the shear stresses. So we can see the variation of the stresses that are acting in these elements along the neutral axis and away from the neutral axis. And you can use the concept of Mohr circle that you learned also during your strength of materials course to determine the value of principal stresses. So these principal stresses are now represented in this second figure here, figure C and figure E. You have major principal stresses and minor principal stresses. So this figure which is figure number C is showing us the value of the major and minor principal stresses for an element somewhere along this beam section here and this figure E 
is representing another element which is somewhere along here. So using the concept of Mohr circle, which we will not go into detail, you can find the major and minor principal stresses and you can also find the angle of inclination of your major principal stress from the beam axis, that is alpha. So if you find these major and minor principal stresses, you can, one thing that you can do is you can draw the trajectory of tension and compression forces. S can be seen here. So let's see here, we have one element here and you can see that this element is being subjected to these tensile forces or tensile stresses F1 in these two directions here. So what happens is that if you draw the tension and compression trajectories you will get the tension and compression trajectories as shown in this diagram here, this diagram here. This dotted line represents the trajectory or in simple words you can say the direction of compression forces or compressive stresses and these solid lines represent the direction of tension forces or tensile stresses. You can see that both of these directions are almost horizontal near the center of the beam and as you gradually move away from the center of the beam towards the edges, then these trajectories or these direction line becomes rather horizontal. So what you can say is that if, let us see the diagram here instead of the diagram below, if you have these tensile forces acting along a small element, then you can see that cracks develop along this surface here. So what you can say is that if this line here represents your trajectory of tensile forces, then let me draw it with another color. The line that is passing through your crack portion or crack length represent your trajectory of compression forces. Let me repeat this once again. If this red line here represents your direction of tensile forces, then the pattern of your cracking or the line along which your element cracks represents the direction of your compression forces. So what you can say is that when your small element in your beam is subjected to tensile forces, then the cracking occurs perpendicular to the compression trajectories. Is this green and red line are perpendicular to each other. So, since these are the cracking pattern due to the uh, tension and compression forces, you can see that wherever we have these tension trajectories, that is this solid line, there you can use some type of reinforcement to prevent those cracking. So, I think we have it in another diagram here. So, different types of cracks are shown here. So different types of cracks that can occur in your beam are shown here. First, let us see here. This is the applied load here. We have a simple support. This represents one end of the beam. The beam is continuous at this left end and we have a continuous support here. Three major types of cracks you can see. One is the flexural cracks, which occur where there are predominant flexural forces. Another you have the flexor shear crack. And another you have this flexural and flexor shear cracks. Or if you say these are the same type, then the last type of crack is this wave shear. So let us start with these wave shear cracks. These wave shear cracks occur near the end of your beam where there are high concentration of compressive shear forces. That is large value of shear forces V. And these wave cracks are generally inclined in nature. The section of your beam where the moment or the flexural forces are the highest have these type of vertical flexural cracks. These vertical flexural cracks generally start at the 
edge of your beam that is these points here and they travel upwards in a rather horizontal or in a rather vertical line so these are the type of flexural cracks and finally your flexor shear cracks are such that when they originate from the end of your beam they are rather vertical but when these cracks near reach near the neutral axis these cracks start to become inclined in this way so for large values of shear forces and large value of bending moments you will have this flexural and flexor shear cracks for medium value of shear forces and medium value of bending moments you will have this flexor shear cracks which will start vertically from the edge but will become inclined as there is the neutral axis and for large value of shear forces you will have this wave shear cracks so this is the behavior of our reinforced concrete beam when there is no shear reinforcement and when it is in uncracked stage so this brings us to the end of today's lecture in another lecture we will look at the behavior of our beam when they are cracked and when there is no shear reinforcement plus when there is shear reinforcements so we'll meet again soon in our next lecture till then stay safe and thank you